And we're going to do something a little different in the series. We're going to look at probably one of the most amazing conversions to ever happen upon this earth from one that was a murderer of the church to becoming one of the greatest encouragements to the church. He had a name change, and I know you know who he, who he is. Started with Saul and ended up as Paul. And so we're going to walk through that journey of his uh, transformation, his regeneration uh, in, a, in a number of messages. But the first one we're going to look at today is entitled, My Choice, Your Pain. I'm going to say that again. My Choice, Your Pain. Sin is a personal choice that impacts the lives of others. We are very protective of our sin, and we will guard it with so much of our strength. And sometimes we feel like our sin is just something that affects us, but sin's hurt reaches beyond the sinner. You been there? Someone makes the choice of not following the steps of God, and then you didn't make that choice for them, but the choice that they made comes back and it hits you dead center. Because sin's hurt reaches beyond the center. But our flesh tells us my choice, my consequences. I live however I want to live, so just back off and let me be me. But the problem is my choices impact more than just me. Our choices are very personal to us, and when our flesh is that which leads us, that nature we were born with, when we begin to walk in sin, we, get, we again preserve our sin by this powerful word, justifying it. This is why I am doing this, so just leave me alone. It's between me and God, and I'm cool with it, so you need to be cool with it. See, self-justification inflicts pain to others in our name. I continue in rebellion. I hurt others with my choices. And basically, when they feel the pain, who are they looking at? They're looking at us. But there's another type of per, um, preserving of sin that scares me with all of my, the core of who I am. And it's called self-righteousness. Another way of saying self-righteousness is the spirit of religion. When we are puffed up in our self-righteousness, when we are mesmerized or in bondage to the spirit of religion, self-righteousness the spirit of religion inflicts pain to others in the name of God. You know how many people this morning that would have gone to church, but somebody living in that self-righteousness got a hold of them and their choices inflicted so much pain on that other person and it was done in the name of who? The name of God. So they've written off faith. It's a frightening thing. Paul was a self-righteous man, or let me say it this way, Saul was a self-righteous man. But we're going to look at his journey to becoming one of the greatest men to ever hold faith in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9 verse 1 gives us a little background on Paul, and let's look at this for a moment. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found any there who belonged to, let's say those two words together, the way, which is a church, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Paul was seeking out 
Christians that were in the synagogues to murder them, men and women. And again, you're going to hear me interchange his name, Saul and Paul, but you know who I'm talking about. The hardest heart to change is a self-righteous heart. It's very difficult to change a self-righteous heart because the source of regeneration is substituted by a lie. That is why we have to be so cautious about the faith that we embrace. Because we can feel like we're in the center of God's will. But if that spirit is the spirit of religion, it is lying to us that we are okay. That was Paul's condition. Saul was in this place where he thought he was right when he was totally, totally wrong. A heart filled with the spirit of religion is really Hard to change. The spirit of truth is rejected by the flesh, and a spirit of a lie in the name of God is embraced. Saul was unrivaled in his self righteousness. Let me ask you, you ever been there? You ever been enamored by the spirit of religion? I'll raise my hand, I have. And, and guess what? I'm gonna I'm gonna have those times again. Because the flesh loves to get in the way of where the spirit is. And even in the regenerated heart, the flesh doesn't like being pushed down and told to die. So it will come back and it will come back with cloaks of self-righteousness. And try to avert the intentions that God has for us and keeping us in church all the time. No greater commitment to the spirit of, of religion could be found than in the life of Saul. Saul supported his sin by surrounding himself with familiar spirits. Now, now let's look at this again, verses 1 and 2 of Acts 9. Look at what, what Saul was doing. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. A little bit about Saul. He was a religious leader. He was a Pharisee. He was phenomenal in what he did in the sense that there was none that probably practiced that role of a Pharisee any greater than Saul did. He was diligent. He was committed. He gave his energy to that which he said he sold out to, and that which he sold out to was a spirit of religion. He was proud to be a Jew. He was proud to be one that was seen as a servant of God but he missed it because the Messiah was right before him, yet he rejected truth because he understood what it was like to hold on to being born of the lie and not of the truth. But, but look at this for a minute. Saul called his hate worship and honor to God. Saul called his hate Worship and honor to God. When we begin to grow in Christ, sometimes we step into a self-righteous mindset and instead of showing love to others, sometimes we can just show ridicule. But ridicule doesn't win people to truth. All it does is build walls that separate them from truth. But, but here's the thing. Saul surrounded himself with familiar spirits. There were Pharisees that came to accept Jesus as Messiah during the time of Paul's rebellion. So some received, some turned and went to truth. But Saul kept in his heart and in his counsel those that rejected Jesus. And it made him feel even that much more self-righteous. Give me letters. So I can go into these synagogues and pull these people out and see them brought to justice. Not God's justice, but the justice of Saul's fallen heart. See, Saul's sin equaled death to others. My choice, your pain. The time of conversion 
the, the steps towards it was this season where his choices meant tremendous pain and even death to others. And I know you know the story of Stephen when he was stoned, but look at what Saul's attitude was towards the stoning of a righteous man by the name of Stephen that was filled with the love of God. And Saul approved of their killing him, stoning him in the streets. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea, Judea and Samaria. So here, the church in its early development met persecution at a murderous level. So if you accepted the Messiah, you were risking your own life. What did that do to faith? Persecution has been known to do this to faith. It weeds out those that are playing games. And it strengthens those that are real. Because when you're facing death, and you're willing to die for your faith, and you're going through suffering for your faith, yet you hold on, what does that say? It says you really believe in what you have allowed to live in your heart. And not only that, it has sustained you. And here's the sign. There are many people that will die for faith. We, we know uh, radical Islam. People sometimes will put on bombs and blow up themselves for their what? Their faith. But here's the thing. Faith that is of the truth is seated totally in love, not hate. And in the eyes of Stephen, one of the things that stands out about his encounter with persecution that led to death was that in his face was the countenance of an angel because there was such love within him. And he knew whose hand he was in, not in the hands of the stoners, but in the hands of God. So from the presence of his enemy, he came and was ushered into the presence of the Lord. And his countenance lived on. I believe it lived on in the heart of Saul as well. Now, as we looked at the stoning of Stephen, Saul's heart could not perceive his sin. Saul was consumed by the spirit of religion, yet blind to the spirit of truth. Can, can you imagine to be so blind that one that is filled mightily with the presence of God, you take delight throwing stones at them until they die? How, how sad and how blind is that? But here's the other thing. In, in our day and age, in America, we're not picking up stones from the ground to throw at people, are we? We're lifting up those words, those verbal stones, and throwing at people. And, and you crush the body is one thing, but you crush the spirit is another thing. Sin's perception so distorted Saul's understanding that he thought his actions pleased God. My choice, your pain. What impact are our choices having on the lives of others? Or does it even matter to us? Are we so focused in on ourselves that we don't think about the fruit of our actions and the fruit of our choices? Our choices can bring blessings or they can bring pain. Saul's life collided, though, with God's mercy. <laughs> How do you go from being so evil to being such a true man of righteousness, of God's righteousness in him. I mean, this is an amazing story because, again, if you wanted to find the villain of villains, you would pick Saul. If you wanted to pick the hero of heroes in the New Testament, you would pick Paul. Most of what leads the church the vessel that God chose to speak to, so it was recorded to our hearing, is Paul. It's amazing. It's amazing. But there's a reason behind it. What impact are our choices having on the lives of others? 
Again, our choices bring blessings or pain. Saul's life collided with God's mercy. We see in 1 Timothy uh, verses 13 through 15. Let's look at this real close. This is what happened to him in his own words. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and what? A violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now, now, Now let's go further. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me in, excuse me, on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in, let's say his name together, Christ Jesus. Verse 15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. You ever had anybody say something negative about themselves? He said, oh, that's not, no, that's not really true. But inside you're saying, yeah, that's really it. <laughs> well, he's saying, he's getting ahead of that, and he's saying, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, not to polish the self-righteous, right? Not to put the halo on the self-righteous, no. Not to puff up the religious pride, No. Christ came into the world to save sinners. And here's Paul, self-proclamation, of whom I am the worst. That wasn't false humility. That was truth. And let's get this. That's the word of God. So if it wasn't truth, it wouldn't be where? In there. Even God said, yeah, you can write that. In fact, I put that in your heart to write. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, let's say these four words together, the worst of sinners. It's not supposed to stop there though, right? Because some people stop it there and say, I'm just, I'm evil. So God's grace come. I'm terrible. I'm working on my terrible to be even more terrible. So God's grace come. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. Christ Jesus, let me go back at the beginning, but for this very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example, oh thank you Lord, for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Thank you Lord Jesus. Thank you Lord. Do you want your choices to bless others or to cause pain? But Paul was in this mode where his choices that were lifted up in in a distorted way of honor to God, his choices were bringing immense pain to others. And that's one thing I believe as we journey towards regeneration, we have to take a true look at who we truly are. And we can't be fooled by how that spirit of religion will keep us in a bad state and make us think that we're pleasing God, but all along we're not. That is what happened to Saul. Choices that bring God's blessing. I just want to look at a few of those this morning. If we want our choices to bring, excuse me, to bring blessings to others. Think of it this way. Ask God this. God, help me to see my life as you see me. Is it, that's a scary thing, isn't it? Did the mirror lie to you this morning? It didn't lie, did it? I mean, he lied about what the mirror showed, but um, and and, um, the mirror doesn't lie. And if we ask God to reveal our lives to us as he sees them, it is not going to be something that overwhelms us, but it will be an encouragement of where God wants us to be. But we must be willing to say, God, I want my choices to bring your blessings to others. So God, help me see my life as you see me. Verse 13, even though I was once, look at this. I, Paul says, I'm a blasphemer. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. 
I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. But he says this, Saul's new understanding, the re regenerated vision, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was a violent man. Now here's the thing, when God reveals those natures that we allow to live in us, those actions that we allow to live in us, we must understand that once we have been held captive by the flesh, the flesh will always seek to return to that which it had conquered. So we must daily ask God to reveal to us a true understanding of who we are. And what are my choices doing to others? Paul saw it once. I'm right and I'm not wrong. God's happy with me. I am the one that is going after the heretics. No, no. God showed up. He says, no, I'm the blasphemer. I'm the heretic here, God. I'm the persecutor. I am not righteously protecting uh, the, the, uh, the body of, of, of Christ or, or, excuse me, Judaism. But I'm actually becoming a persecutor of the God I say I love. And a violent man, instead of showing love, I am delighted when others are even murdered or killed because of my testimony and my actions. Choices that bring God's blessing. Another one is this. Ask God this. God, pour out your mercy on me so I can see my, how my actions impact others. Pour out your mercy where I can see how my actions impact others. Mercy awakens us to who we truly are. Now, I'm going to share an abbreviated story of one of the most clear memories of when God's mercy came, up, came across my head. Slap on my face, okay? Mercy is a collision. Because when we understand we don't deserve it, when it shows up, it stops us in our tracks. And I remember one morning, a rowdy little 12-year-old kid, mouthy. And I told you, my mom, I love my mom. My mom is a very godly lady that was raising a very ungodly 12-year-old. At least on that morning. It was a battle. It was a battle. And I remember getting in my mama's face. You said it. What? And my mama, I ain't going to tell you what she did. But I looked at it, and I was hit with the reality. And I looked at my mama, and you know what God's mercy did? What kind of evil are you letting live in your heart to cause your mama to wake you up in that manner? Mercy showed me who I was. Because my response normally would be, you're just mean. I and gotten mad. Mercy allowed me to see myself. And when God shows up in mercy, it will shake us to our core. Because when we take a real look at what the flesh looks like in us, it better wake us up. Because the flesh has one intention. That nature that we were born with has one intention. And that is to keep us separated from God. It doesn't mind us being morally good. It doesn't mind us being good people at all. It doesn't mind that. What it hates is us being regenerated, being born again, being led by the Spirit of God, being made anew. That's what it hates. But if I want my choices to bring God's blessings, may I ask God to pour out His mercy on me at such a level I can see my actions, how my actions impact others. Another choice that brings God's blessing is this. Ask God, pour out your grace on me to teach and to guide my steps. 
See, grace is a power. Grace is not an excuse. Grace is not an excuse to continue in sin. Grace is a learning power. Grace comes and it's teaching us that that sin that we're drawn to is not our friend and is not that which is going to sustain us in life. It will take us from true life. And grace comes and it says, don't reason, don't make excuses. Repent and turn and let the power of grace teach and show us how we must get away from choices that not only damage us, even though we can't see it at times, but damage the lives of others as well. See, God poured out, again, God, pour out your grace on me to teach and to guide my steps. 1 Timothy 1.14, let's look at that again. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me, thank you Lord, abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in, where? In Christ Jesus. Again, a choice that brings God's blessing is God pour out your faith to me, that it will live in my heart and live out in my actions to others. How sad it is for somebody to wake up on Sunday morning, Come into the presence of the Lord or go into a service somewhere and listen to the word. Yet when we return home, we begin to just verbally throw rocks and stones at our family. Yet we show our kids here, mom is telling me she is a what? A Christian. And maybe even to the point, I am born again. Yet the faith that is entered into the heart brings no change to the actions and the steps of the life. See, the faith that is going to come from the Lord is going to change our actions to others. Love God what? Uh, You got that. You got that. You got that. You got that. Without a doubt. But there's two clear commands of Jesus. Love God, as you said, and love people. You can't, you, can't, you can't get away with true regeneration by just saying I'm loving God, but I'm not loving people. And someone says, I am loving people. The people that are nice to me, right? The people that I can find a common ground with, But it's everybody that God will bring into your life. God will show you a path that can show love to them. Again, not saying that you don't have to say truth to people. You don't have to deal with things. But I'm saying love cuts through any hate that comes. Any hate that comes. Choices, again, that bring God's blessing. I ask you, God. God, pour out your love into my heart that it overflows to bless others. God, pour out your faith to me that it will live in my heart and live out in my steps and my actions to others. And then 1 Timothy 1, 14 again. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Thank you, Lord. Along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Who was, who was Saul rejecting? That's right. The source that had everything that was needed for his heart, he attacked the most, and he sought to kill anyone that even brought honor to his name. That are in Christ Jesus. We are regenerated by Jesus. By what he did for our sins, he took our sins upon himself and died in our place. And in Christ, we have now the opportunity to be born of the Spirit. We have the opportunity in Christ to be born again. We know what it's like to be born of the flesh, to be born of water, the natural birth. 
But do we know what it's like to be born of the Spirit? If, if, if we do not understand that and align that birth, nurture that birth each day, we will miss the mercy, the purpose of the mercy living out in our lives. See, mercy changed Saul's destiny. There was nothing about Saul that, that deserved mercy, is, is there? And there's nothing in us that deserves mercy. The problem, and I believe one of the foundations of the spirit, uh, the spirit of religion, is when I think I deserve it. And how do we do that? Well, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. So I what? I deserve it. We don't deserve it. And, and, and the thing that amazes me, mercy is totally 100% up to God where it lives. That's a scary thing, isn't it? And that, this is what it tells me. Without mercy, we die. Without mercy, we don't change. Without mercy, we stay blinded spiritually. So what should I do? Cry out for your mercy, Lord. Because I want your mercy, God. I don't take it lightly that you want to give me new life. I don't take it lightly that there is a battle that's going on that rages against my very soul. But I call out for mercy. May it be established upside my head, right? May there be collision in our lives with mercy. The one whose choices brought death to others would now bring eternal life. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? The one who rejoiced and gave approval over the stoning of Stephen, the one that sought out approval and letters to go and murder Christians, now the one that sought to kill people would become one of the greatest apostles that would bring eternal life to countless hearts. And even today, the fruit of his ministry is living on. The one whose choices brought death to others would now bring eternal life. Because of mercy, Saul could see himself as God saw him. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Don't take that lightly that he's saying that. Don't take that lightly, the one that was uh, wrapped up and held in bondage to the spirit of religion could now perceive who he truly was. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Basically, this mercy can reach any heart. Mercy can reach any heart. Right now, you might be having a hard time giving mercy to this individual that's been there strategizing, living out steps to just make your life difficult. And, and the real goal is to make you miserable. Yet in your heart, there's been possibly unforgiveness that is welt up because you see them as one that is irredeemable. And that's only God. God is the one who sets mercy on its course. But in us, we can pray for God's mercy to come and be released from the damage of unforgiveness that has been seeded through their actions in our heart. The thing is... The seed may have come from them, but its ability to grow comes from who? Well, no, no, hear me out, hear me out. When someone has seeded uh, offenses in your life, some of them are, are, is horrible and can't even be mentioned maybe. We did not make that seed. That person put that in us, but they put it, in the heart that has a decision to say, seed of unforgiveness, you're not going to live in me. 
You're not going to grow in me and put root in me and seek to destroy me. You're not going to let the fruits of the flesh live out in me because this heart belongs to God and this heart is regenerated and has no ground for unforgiveness to live. That's a clear sign of the heart that's beating life in us. Is the heart that allows unforgiveness to dwell is not the regenerated heart. It is a fallen heart. So here's the thing. Which heart is going to beat life into my body? Is it going to be the new heart or the old heart? The new. You're not going to stay there. You're not going to stay there. Mercy again can reach any heart. Have you collided with God's mercy? The great awakening occurs when men encounter God's great mercy. The spirit of understanding of what Christ has done for us shows us what we have been saved from. It is only by God's mercy that we can see our true self. Don't you want to see yourself how God sees you? Because unless we do, we have no, no calibrating factor. We just dig the hole deeper and deeper. You know, the, you know, how does that go, Pastor? How does that go to hear God give perspective of the reflection of you? It's like this. When I'm making the wrong, entertaining the wrong thought, that voice comes. That is not of me. That is a destructive force at that time I can say you're right get out you're not going to live here it's going to come back but no you're not going to stay there it's going to come and the voice of the Lord the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us but what will we do with the voice when it comes the one that is regenerated the one that understands the mercy that is pronounced when we feel conviction will say, Lord Jesus, empower me to overcome that temptation and let the new heart empower the life that your mercy has given. My choice is not the old nature. My choice is regeneration. A new life that you've given. It is only by God's mercy that we can, excuse me, that we truly care how our choices impact God's purpose in the lives of others. What are we sending out of here this morning when we leave? People of blessings or people that are going to perpetuate pain? We want to we send out people that are going to bring blessings to others. When all of these precious uh, uh, action-packed youngins come back in the scene, right? When they come in the house and, the, and, and when you, ooh, you know what children can do to the household, right? We need God's mercy to be able to love them. Uh, even in the seasons that you go through, you're saying, Lord, all I'm doing is getting on my child. All I'm doing is getting on him. I hate it. It seems like every word, no, no, stop, don't. I'm going to get that. Mr. Slappy's coming out of the drawer, right? And you get tired of it. You get tired of it. But Lord Jesus, your perspective of how to love that which you've entrusted to me. What a blessing. What a blessing. And a challenge. But a blessing. Again, my choices. How are they impacting others? The choice again. My choice, your pain. Or my choice, your your blessing. May it be my choice, your blessing. May it be that, Lord Jesus. And then as we get ready to conclude today, can we just say that word regeneration? Being born again. God didn't call the church to this earth to provide a couple of hour service on Sunday mornings that, that the old nature could just attend to and feel a little bit better about itself. 
No, God brought the church into this earth to be salt and light and to bring truth. And the gospel is this. We must be born again. And that is regeneration. That is when we confess our sins to the Lord and say, God, I repent of my sins. I'm not making excuses for them anymore. I see them as you see them by your mercy. And it's kind of like this. What are you doing? And I'm speaking to myself as well. What are you doing with the old? What are you doing with the old heart? Are we dressing it enough, up enough so that we can tolerate it, so that we can uh, make excuse for it? But what are we doing with the old? Are we cleaning it up, trying to make it a little bit better, shine it, make it presentable so that I feel a little bit better about myself? Meaning, I think I'll just start going to church now. That's good to go to church, but go with open ears. For the gifts that God has for you. And that main gift is to have a regenerated heart, a new heart. What are you doing with the old? Making excuses for it. We do that. This is why I'm like this. This is, this is why. It's because of what? Who, 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 who? It's rarely because of what? Me. Me. What are you doing with the old? What God would have us do is to die to that old nature. Do you this morning desire the new nature? Only mercy can make us want a new heart. Be born of truth. Walk in the new generated life that Jesus died to give you. And if we can, if we can just bow for a moment in prayer this morning. Lord Jesus. Without mercy, we will not even perceive it possible to have a new heart. Without mercy, we do not see sin with the eyes that you want us to see sin with, with your perspective. We see it, Lord, sometimes as a friend, as something necessary, but in all your love, you are faithful to expose its lie to us so that we can live in the newness of life. As we've gathered in the church today, the gathering of the saints, we recognize in the name of Jesus we are gathered. So you are here, Lord Jesus. We have called out for your Holy Spirit to speak to hearts as only you can. Lord Unless the Holy Spirit speaks, truth will not be applied. So speak, Holy Spirit, to all that are gathered here and all that are listening. Speak, Holy Spirit, as only you can. Lord Jesus, let me see myself as you see me. And where there is sin, give me power and grace to turn from that sin. If that's in your heart today, and if we can, if we can just stand to our feet, if you're able today.